All right. Welcome to the first Barbell Medicine podcast that is live. And we're going to answer your questions and also uh, that were submitted via Facebook and that were also submitted via Instagram and also that are on the YouTube chat. So I'm watching that um, and trying to type while I talk at the same time. Um, so this is podcast episode number 19, and this will be uploaded to the uh, Barbell Medicine and it looks like we are live. Good. So this is Barbell Medicine episode number 19. Um, we're going to put this up live um, on YouTube right now. And it'll be saved there. And we're going to answer your questions from Instagram, from Facebook, and then also from the YouTube chat. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for submitting your questions. Let's get right into it. And let's see if we can get some knowledge gains going on here. So first of all, first question. Will Wyatt asks, important to flexibility, not Kelly Star at silliness, but what's a good target to shoot for? Uh, so this is a question we get all the time. How flexible should you be? How mobile should you be? And instead of uh, going over the nuances between flexibility, mobility, and, and really hammering on that, I think the uh, most practical situ or thing that you can um, consider here is there is a balance between stability and mobility um, and uh going towards one end or the other, you sacrifice the the other end. So think about a sport where you have the most amount of mobility. You require the most amount of mobility. So that would be like gymnastics, uh, for instance, okay? So gymnastics joints all have more mobility but less stability than a power lifter, which requires... Um, uh, which requires uh, powerlifting requires less mobility, um, but more uh, stability because of the loads being moved. So, um, how much uh, mobility should you aim for? And my answer to that is it depends on your you know, what you're doing in your life. If you're not a competitive athlete, if you're just training in the gym three to four days a week or more and participating in recreational activities, then the amount of mobility that you want is going to be... Uh, 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 you know, commensurate uh, with your the mobility you require for your daily activities. So, I think what this is going to end up being um, is if you can squat, bench, deadlift, press, chin up, pull up um, without any specific mobility intervention. So things that uh, increase your mobility, then that should be uh, sufficient. If you have other athletic endeavors or other um, activities of daily life that require more mobility then you're going to have to practice those sports, practice those activities to gain the mobility um, specific to each sport. And that's another thing, that mobility is very specific. So um, if you want to do the splits, for instance, the, the easiest way to get to do the splits is to practice the splits. So, all right. Uh, reading some of the chat. All right, looks like we are live. Uh, people can see Austin is trolling me already. This is good news. All right, question number two. Connor Whitehead asks, how do you set your knees in the squat? Um, <laughs> what I, I think he means by this is how do you set the forward knee travel or what is the appropriate forward knee travel in the squat? Um, and this is actually something that we should talk about. Uh, is certain fitness organizations, ones that rhyme with uh, boss fit, uh, suggest that your knees shouldn't go in front of your toes and, and that the weight should be balanced in your heels, for instance. Um, but that is actually wrong. Um, if your weight is in your heels, guess where it's not? In balance over your balance point, which is the middle of the foot for a standing bipedal organism. So uh, if your weight's in your heels, that's just as bad as being on your toes and off your heels. You're just out of balance. So the idea would be that your weight is spread evenly across your entire foot. You're balanced over the midfoot. And the amount of forward knee travel is going to be dependent on uh, A, where you put the bar, B, uh, your anthropometry, and uh, C, your squat depth. So if the bar is in the high bar or front squat position, and if you have long femurs and you're squatting you know, ass to grass, your knees are going to go way forward of your toes. That's just a recipe for knees going forward of the toes. If you have short femurs, if you have a long torso, if you have the bar in the low bar position or any one or all three of those things, the knees aren't going to go very for, uh, far forward uh, of the toes uh, at all. So a lot of this is anthropometry based and then um, the type of squat you're doing. Now, another thing you should we should know is that it doesn't matter how far forward your knees go in a squat. Like it's not injurious to put the knees forward or to get them forward to the toe. It's just a 
you know, something that happens with proper squat mechanics. Um, in any event, how should you set your knees in a squat? The idea is during the first third of the descent, your knees should be as far forward as they're going to go. Uh, easy way to use a tactile cue is to do the terribly useful block of wood excuse me, the two bow. So you place a piece of wood or foam roller that's as tall as your knee, um, about one inch forward of your toe, and you try to get your knees forward to touch but not knock over the block of wood or the foam roller uh, in that first third of your descent, and you should keep your knees there. Don't let them slide forward at the bottom, for instance. All right, next question, Mauro Romero. Uh, if I started the starting strength novice linear progression with previous lifting experience, should it still last like it states in the book, providing recovery resources are optimal? So this depends, and he actually ended up listing uh, his numbers right now. So he's squatting 225, or he started at a 225 squat, 160 pound bench press, or uh, and 315 pound deadlift. He's 5'10", 195 pounds, 22 years old. Um, so yeah, you're still going to be able to do a starting strength novice linear progression. It might be attenuated if you actually trained beforehand, but these numbers don't seem excessively high to me. And I would, you know. Uh, a five foot ten, 195 pound guy holding his back together on a no shit set of 315 um, seems less likely, to be honest. Um, so I'd just be kind of curious about the technique. But if the technique's good and you started the set of uh, your starting strength novice progression where the bar speed started to slow down and your technique was perfect, then I think you're going to be okay. Um, let's take a few questions from the live chat and then we'll uh, bounce back into uh, the ones that are saved from the interwebs. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Tuxos asks, I've tried different grip widths and lumbar uh, flexion, which helps some, but not completely. Uh, it's actually, oh, sorry. Uh, the squat grip irritates his ulnar nerve, form is good. You get numbness. How should you deal with this? Yeah, or pressing irritates the ulnar nerve. So it depends on your grip. So I think the grip should be about 16 and a half inches apart on the on the press. That's right at the start of the knurling on a standard uh, power bar. Um, you shouldn't have excessive wrist extension. Um, that can also compress on the ulnar nerve. And then additionally, if you're still having a bunch of wrist pain, the easiest thing to do is to wear wrist wraps. There may not be anything wrong with your wrist. You just may have some wrist pain that's preventing you from training consistently and productively. And in which case you can employ a wrist wrap um, um, and that would be a good solution there. So well, let's see another question from the YouTube live chat. Aside from milk, what are the best foods to battle gains of pina? So I actually don't think there's, you know, the, the, the thing about milk that makes it super useful is that it's got a, it's a animal derived protein. It's rich in essential amino acids, particularly leucine. Um, other animal source derived proteins are super useful as well. Uh, milk's also convenient, portable. It's got a good dose of carbs and fat in it as well, so it's you know fairly complete. Uh, but I think any food you know can can really work in the context of somebody who's eating a high protein diet, eating an adequate amount of carbohydrates. So uh, my favorite for when I was trying to gain weight were peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I would do that with protein shakes. I mean, I talk talking two to three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches at a time. The idea was gain weight, you know, so the people who I can't gain weight, I can't gain weight. You should be, you know, PBJ in your way uh, up in body weight. Uh, let's see. Last question from the YouTube folks, and then we'll pop back over to the uh, submitted questions. Um, Chef asks, what was your experience with medical school? How did I know it was for me? You know, that's an interesting question. So I didn't know that medical school was for me as evidenced by the fact that I went back to medical school from the real world, quote unquote. Uh, so I was 26 when I entered medical school. Uh, even through going through it, I still wasn't sure if it's for me. And, you know, people could argue that since I'm not practicing in a clinic or a hospital, um, that maybe I shouldn't have gone to medical school, but I really did enjoy the training. I enjoyed learning the nuance and how to think like a doctor. Um, and I'm, I'll be ever grateful for my training. So. Uh, that being said, you know, I still trained as much as I wanted to, and I got to travel a lot and got to do a lot of cool things. So very, very uh, cool experience. All right, back to the questions from uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook. Scott Holcomb asks, can you explain pushing knees out hard in the squat? So pushing the knees out is a cue that you'll often hear to get folks to externally rotate their femurs such that the femurs are then in line with the foot. So if your feet are, if your knees are outside of your foot, that's varus knee. If your knees cave in, that's valgus knee. And so you might hear people say, cue the knees out, knees out, knees out. Um, so you don't get a valgus knee. If the knees come in, you can get a slight uh, soft tissue hip impingement. And I don't mean that from a pain standpoint. I mean that from a limiting depth standpoint. 
Um, also, then if you're bending over quite a bit, uh, yeah, it would prevent depth, uh, would prevent uh, good stretch reflex and good squat mechanics. So a lot of times we'll cue knees out um, to make sure that the femurs are directly in line with the foot. Now, someone like myself, I never cue knees out uh, for myself because if I do, I'll actually go too far, uh, varus knee, and so you wouldn't want that. So the idea is uh, if the knees out cue is to um, keep the knees and the femurs subsequently in line with the toes. All right, this question is from Matt Reynolds, but not the handsome Matt Reynolds out of Springfield, Missouri. Um, this is another Matt Reynolds. He says, I'm the dude who always complains in the forum about not being able to bench half of his squat, and recently it's possible relation to testosterone, androgen receptors, hormones, etc. So on the forum, he's asked about TRT and androgen density receptor, uh, or and, andro androgen receptor density. And uh, so he's uh, saying he's 185 pounds, got 39 inch waist, 5'10, he deadlifts 523, squats 402, 192 pound bench press, and 154 pound press. My arms measure normal length, but my bench hasn't responded to basically any standard programming protocol that I can think of. He's currently running heavy light medium for the squat and the deadlift. Uh, so here's the thing one, your waist is high, but your body weight is low, which uh, you know, on a spectrum of super athletic guys, uh, who are going to have, you know, high testosterone, you know, big shoulders, lots of upper body mass, uh, muscle mass, you're, you know, not all, you're not on that athletic end, but you know, that doesn't mean that you can't have a big bench press. It just means that it's going to require a little more effort. And so a, a person who is on that, at, that end might be 185 pounds, 32 inch waist, you know, five at 10 and going to be carrying a lot more mass in their upper body. Um, the other thing is it looks like your deadlift is pretty high. Um, I don't know if you can keep your back flat and pull 523, and I don't mean that as a negative, a negative slight, but I'm just saying that number seems out of proportion to your other numbers. The other thing I notice is that you're benching 192 and you're pressing 154, which just tells me that your pressing strength is, you know, decent it's not you know super super strong but i think in that same stage of development but you are not able to translate that into your bench press so technique certainly stands out to me um ultimately practicing at heavier loads uh i'm not sure what you're doing there i don't think heavy light medium has anything unique in it from a volume perspective or skill set practice standpoint um that would in make me inclined to think it would work super well I think if you want your bench to go up, you're going to need to do, you know, singles um, prior to your volume sets. You're probably going to need more volume. You may need to bench press more if you're only bench pressing once a week. I would, you know, increase that that frequency to two to three times per week, and you can still press um, and try to get your upper body to grow and get more exposure to these singles. So that would be my off-the-cuff recommendations there. All right, we'll do this last question from the Facebook thing. We'll jump back to the YouTube live. Uh, Fernando Castro, Austin mentioned being in maintenance without tracking his calories, but rather weighing himself in the morning and at night. How would I apply this in a hypercaloric state? So if you're in a hypercaloric state, you'd be looking to have an uh, uh, increase in body weight. So if your body weight's not increasing on the scale regularly, then you would need to add more meals or more food to each meal. Uh, and then you wouldn't necessarily be discreetly tracking calories. You'd just be tracking your weight and seeing how that changes. Would I recommend it? I think you can do a trial uh, where you're doing using that sort of feedback to guide your eating. And if it works over a series of weeks, then you effectively have shown that you can do that and make progress. And if it doesn't work over a series of weeks, then I think you might have to take the harder road, which is going to be counting calories discreetly. All right, back to the YouTube live feed. Uh, let's see. Should I be recommending? Should I be recommending starting strength LP for people looking for weight loss? Uh, yeah, if they're untrained, I don't know of a better way to train. Let's see. Is the bridge suitable to run? Nathan Henderson asks, is the bridge suitable to run more than once if a starting strength online coaching is out of price range? Uh, yeah, I think so, especially if you're a good responder initially. I mean, that basically suggests that the volume, the frequency, and the exercise selection was appropriate, and you probably get another eight, eight weeks out of it for sure. All right, Nary Men asks, when is the right time to shed body fat gain during LP? Um, it depends. I mean, if you're around 25% body fat, but your waist measurements, you know, under 37 inches, for instance, then maybe it's still time to keep gaining a little bit or at least maintain. But if you're over that, if you're closer to 40 inches uh, on your waist and your body fat's getting up there and you're feeling relatively uncomfortable and you've actually been trained for a while. Um, so this is not the guy who squats 225 and is 25% body fat. That person's just undertrained. 
um, but, but if you know you're not that person, person yeah, yeah, you could uh, you could decrease, uh, cut down, down on your on your calorie, calorie. and take slightly to lose some some uh, body fat. All right, last question from the YouTube guys, and we'll pop back over here. Let's see. Thoughts on exclusively pausing on the chest when training the bench press? I think that's a reasonable thing that you can do, it's particularly if you have a meet coming up. Um, so if you have a meet coming up, where you, a powerlifting meet, where you're going to pause uh, the bar on your chest, excuse me, um, you can you can do all of your pause, your variations or all your benching paused uh, as you get closer and closer to the meet. So that's a reasonable thing. Um, additionally, if you have some shoulder issues, you might find that actually the stretch reflex may hurt the shoulder a little more, um, particularly if you're not good at keeping your shoulders pulled back at the bottom of the bench press. So I think either way would work okay um, uh, for pausing the bench press. All right, back to the Facebook questions. Ben Baker asks, what are strategies that you can provide to combat the spread of misinformation by people in positions of authority, i.e. physicians, physical therapists? Uh, he says, especially in regards to pain management, structuralism, nocebo, etc." Yeah, it's a very interesting question. Um, how to spread or how to stop the spread of misinformation? You know, the, the thing is to have a healthy dose of skepticism, not only as a patient, but also as a provider, you know, we have all these sort of thoughts in our head, uh, you know, what we expect, what we, um, our belief systems, um, you know, our current line of thinking. And the idea is to always be challenging that. And I think that good scientists and good clinicians do that on a regular basis. They'll start, you know, getting a groove of saying something over and over again, and they'll just think, is that true? Or has this, you know, has the evidence changed? So that's thing one, always having a healthy dose of skepticism. Two is st trying to stay as current as possible on the literature. So, so for some folks, that means being involved in an academic institution. They're just surrounded by the latest and greatest. Uh, for other folks, that means having a journal club with friends, sending people papers, you know, reviewing stuff regularly. Uh, others, it just means reading something every day. They just get in that habit and they just do it. So I think staying abreast of information is also good. And I think the third thing kind of relates uh, to to the first, uh, when you have this healthy dose of skepticism, that being an early adopter of things in certain instances has its advantages, but not usually in the fitness industry or health industry. So you want to know that something's worked well for a long period of time and has good, you know, even if it's just empirical or anecdotal evidence, you don't want something, oh yeah, look, there's a six week trial where this thing massively outperformed placebo. It's like, yeah, well, how does it work? What's the difference over a year, for instance? Do we know anybody who's done this? Um, let's get some information there. Uh, so I, I think that is, those are probably the big three things. Um, and you don't have to be a jerk about it. I'm definitely guilty of being salty uh, about things from time to time because I just get frustrated, you know, about the spread of misinformation by people uh, of power. But I will say this, it's interesting, you know, you don't have a lot of, it's not to say that there are none, but you don't have a lot of MD, MD, PhDs, you know, really, really smart folks, DOs or whatever, who are out there, you know, clamoring about really, really egregiously wrong things. I mean, yeah, look, we'll get it wrong periodically, and sometimes our thoughts are uh, misguided, but a lot of this is low stakes. And what I mean by that is, you know, when your doctor says just walk or, you know, don't lift because your knees are going to hurt, yeah, that's wrong. It's patently wrong. And on some level, you could argue that that's a that's a, a high stakes in, you know, situation that you had an opportunity to get a person to exercise, start training, um, and, and you missed it. Uh, however, you know, that's not as egregious as the keto person on Instagram saying, Hey, don't do chemotherapy. Don't get your flu vaccine. Don't do, you know, don't vaccinate your children. Just, you know, feed them juice plus and don't eat carbs, you know, or just war on carbs for everything. It, it, you know, that stuff is, high stakes, potentially really injurious, um, and can negatively affect people's health. So I think, you know, I think if we're going to hold doctors and, and physical therapists and other, you know, healthcare professionals to this high standard, let's hold, let's hold our, our, uh, you know, Instagram heroes to that same standard and maybe they can stay in their lane, you know, that's, but I, I'll, I'll get off my horse there. Um, all right, last question from the Instagram, Facebook folks, and then we'll pop back to the YouTube livers. Uh, Mike Grillo asks, he's currently in the sixth week of an accumulation phase, planned on doing a low stress week this week, but kept with the accumulation phase because I don't feel beat up and numbers are going up week over week. Question, would you recommend doing a low stress week before you feel fatigued, beat up, or wait till you feel fatigued and implement? Um, so I think he kind of answered his own question. You know, things are generally 
going up, the estimated 1RMs or performance is improving and doesn't necessarily feel too fatigued. I would add a layer of nuance to this and I would say it doesn't matter what you feel like, it matters what the objective performance is. So I think implementation of a low stress week or low stress period of time should probably only be undertaken once performance actually has dropped off. Um, that it's not better explained by something that you can control. So for instance, if your estimated 1RM or your performance is going up, going up, going up, uh, and your girlfriend breaks up with you and you have a bad session, okay, well, that's probably, you don't need a, a low stress week. You just, you know, you might need a couple days and some good social support. Um, but if you're, um, if, if uh, basically everything's going down and you haven't gone, you know, cut your calories and you haven't been, you know, out partying all the time and basically no other explanation and your numbers just start dropping off, that's an, that's a sign that you need to pivot to a different type of training block because uh, you're no longer getting a response from the stimulus. All right. So that's basically what that is. And I think he ended up answering his own question there. All right. Back to the YouTubes. Doug Auerbach. Not to be confused with our box plexus in your GI system. Uh, you said we need about 30 grams of protein per feeding to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. How long is a single meal? Within a half hour window, for example? Um, I don't remember the data offhand, but I do believe they were bolusing people, um, you know, letting them eat. Uh, you know, in 30 minute to 45 minutes um, from start to finish. And it was just, the main thing is it was discreet. They weren't, you know, grazing all day. So I think that's, that's, you have the right idea there. Emmanuel Garcia, one of my thoughts on strong first and how do their barbell set of certifications differ from starting strength? Uh, I will tell you that I've never been to a strong first certification. I have a few friends who have, and then they, after a weekend of that, they pepper me with these, you know, what are your thoughts on certain things? So I do not think that the people who do strong first know how to coach the barbell lifts as evidenced by the videos they show of them coaching the lifts. I do not think they know how to program. I do not think that they are familiar with exercise physiology and strength and performance training. I think that it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and weird ideas that are not based in actual science and ultimately people are willing to pay for that i mean look any any certification that revolves or that has you go to strongman or kettlebell implement is you know effectively more for fun than it is for performance and it is for actual coaching so anyway i'm glad that they can make a living in our society that's all cool but i would not recommend it for um you know good good strength and conditioning education Let's see. Uh, do, do, do. Should I? Oh, Ethan, should I actually bolt to 400 pounds? Uh, so this is a guy, he's 17 years old or 16 years old, who pulled 405, now wants to know what he needs to do to pull 700. And what you don't know is there's a decade that's likely going to happen, or at least five years or so that's going to go on between your 405 pull and, you know, what's going on now. So a lot of things are going to happen. I don't think you should actually bolt to 400, but you're going to have to gain some weight. Um, and I, I believe you were like 5'10 or something like that. So, you know, 242, 220, all the way up to 275 could be anywhere in there. If you ever pull 700, you know, it's not everybody gets there, but I hope you do. Let's see. Priscilla De La Torre. Powerlifting women on the internet get lots of hate for big arches in their bench due to the limited range of motion. If not training for a meet, but just general strength as a woman, is the big arch appropriate useful? Well, so the arch allows you to use more weight, which allows you to use more motor units, but it does cut down the range of motion, which effectively decreases uh, the amount of muscle mass being used. But then you're trying to make up with that with heavy make up for that with heavier weights. So for general strength training, I don't think using the maximum arch that you can use, if it is excessive, which I cannot define at this point, it'd be an arbitrary range of motion that's meaningless without context. Um, but I think if you are capable of a huge, huge arch, um, but you're not going to compete, you're just training for general strength and conditioning, then using that monster arch is probably not terribly useful for getting generally strong. Now, if you're going to a meet, that's a skill you should probably learn, and it's not going to hurt you um, in general. There you go. All right, last question from the YouTube. I uh, think before we switch back over to the Facebook, Instagram questions. Andrew Franzen uh, says, I can do 305 for a good set of five on your bench, which suggests you should be able to max about 360, but you have not been able to hit 340. Yeah, so the thing is, your, gen your general strength is high because you can do 305 for five, and we're assuming that you are not 
you know, balancing your bench press uh, significantly. Um, that's just more of a touch and go. Uh, and so your general strength is high, but you're not, you're unable to translate that into a true one RM that's reflective of your actual strength, which suggests to me that you haven't practiced your one RM. Um, and you haven't practiced actually uh, uh, doing a lot of singles, so you are not as trained at doing those singles. So the easiest thing you can do is do a single at a weight that would be like a max effort triple prior to all of your bench sessions for, for a few weeks and see if that allows you to manifest a max effort bench press that's more uh, accurate uh, to your current strength levels. All right, let's go back to... Let's go back to... Um, the questions from YouTube and the Instagrams. All right, Philip Yazbek says, tips and tricks for losing body fat while doing starting strength LP, i.e. prioritizing body fat loss while doing the program, even if that slows down the progression. So one would be adding conditioning. Um, so when you get to phase two, you can add in some cardio and I would probably do low intensity steady state cardio one day per week for about 30 minutes at a heart rate uh, and respiratory rate where you can talk in full sentences but you can't sing, should be about an RPE six. Um, you know, pretty easy, more boring than hard. That way it's not too fatiguing, but does provide some aerobic training. And then the other session you should do once per week should be high intensity interval training, particularly with a modality that it has no eccentric or minimal eccentric. So that would be assault bike sprints. That would be prowler sprints, something like that, or sprints on the rower, um, 20 seconds of effort every two minutes on the minute for, you know, six to seven rounds. That'd be a good place to start. And then you need to be in a caloric deficit. So how do you trick yourself into being in a caloric deficit? You eat fiber-rich foods, eat a lot of protein that's lean, so low in fat. Don't add any fat to your diet. Uh, and you should weigh yourself frequently. And you should use an app like MyFitnessPal to track your intake. That would be my tips and tricks off the cuff. Pete Trupos, one of our starting strength coaches. I love his questions. Uh, he just moved down to Dallas, I believe. Uh, would you rather be a world champion athlete, but you're five foot tall, or be six foot two without a shred of athleticism? Well, you know, I don't really like. I like athletics, but I don't like sports. I know that sounds weird, but I like, you know, uh, the history and the records and the pushing human performance and athleticism, but and athletics rather. But sports to me, that so here's the deal. I think it, I'd rather be six foot two and be really smart and just be a recreational athlete because being five foot tall, I don't know, man. See, I'm already five ten and a half, and I think if I were significantly shorter, that I, you know, I'd have a complex. And people always say when they meet me, "Oh, you're way bigger in person," and to that, I think they just think I'm like five foot six or something like that. No offense to those who are five foot six, but hey, I'm five ten and a half. Don't knock the, the half inch; it's important. So I, I would have to go six foot two. Jason Keith asks, question, three, uh, should I take three to five grams of leucine 10 to 15 minutes before a meal that's containing 30 grams to 40 grams of protein to maximize muscle protein synthesis? And I would say no. I think uh, the only reason you should do that if you, the proteinaceous meal you're about to consume is based off vegetable protein and not animal protein because 30 to 40 grams of protein from an animal source is going to have a lot of leucine. Uh, Eduardo Iamas. What is a cramp and why can it be so painful? So basically, it is a contraction of the motor unit that is sustained and you're not, it's not relaxing and it causes a bunch of pain um, because that is your uh, response to not being able to relax your motor units. Um, what can be done to alleviate them? So basically, cramps occur secondary to fatigue, right? So it's not an electrolyte imbalance unless you have some sort of uh, a metabolic problem or you have an electrolyte uh, disorder where you're actually losing tons and tons of like potassium or magnesium or something like that. Um, but that doesn't really occur in athletics uh, to a significant degree. In fact, you can cramp with normal levels of potassium and magnesium. It's more of an over fatigue kind of issue. So how do you limit fatigue? You drink water, um, uh, like cold water, for instance, if you're overheated or getting warm because it lowers your core temperature a little bit, you make sure that you have adequate salt intake pre and post workout. You can use pickle juice to uh, swish and spit. That tends to that has evidence to show that it lowers fatigue, just like a sweetened beverage. You don't actually have to swallow it. You can just swish it around your mouth. There are receptors in the roof of your mouth that effectively tell that you have carbs or salt or both coming in, and that can lower your fatigue. And you can make sure your training volume is correct. Um, usually people will cramp when they're over fatigued. That's just well, how the how that works. 
All right, last question from the Instagram and Facebook folks, and we'll go back to the YouTube live stream. Erwin Bias. So Erwin Loss or Bias. I'm not sure if that's an I or no. Uh, what injuries have you gotten throughout my lifting career, your lifting career that was caused by lifting, and what could you have done differently to prevent them? So I just looked at my shoulder once uh, doing incline dumbbell bench press, and I was just being stupid. Um, I didn't have anybody helping me get the dumbbells up, and I was just going, excuse me, a little too heavy that day for what I had already been, um, you know, planned uh, to go. And the issue is, you know, the thing is, yeah, you have, you know, it's harder to get the dumbbells in position for heavy dumb and inclined dumbbell bench press. And, you know, I was doing sets of five. And I think, you know, when you think about the risk reward, it's not a terribly good strength exercise compared to other things we already have out there, like flat uh, barbell bench press or just inclined barbell bench, which you can overload anyway, or load heavier weights without having to worry about kicking the dumbbells up and get them in position. So using exercises that are difficult to load for heavy heavy you know low low rep sets just seems like a a, a a tilted you know sort of risk benefit sort of situation so i would have probably just not done that um other things i've had i have bilaterally torn hip labrums on imaging i don't know where that came from it's probably had it for a bunch of years and it was symptomatic when i was squatting on an uneven surface and it went away when i started squatting on a level surface so i would not squat on that uneven surface um, I've had a bunch of back tweaks over the years, but I don't know if there's any one thing that causes them. It just has happened. It doesn't happen frequently enough for me to know know why. Um, and of course, occasionally, you know, elbow, shoulder, stuff like that. So uh, nothing, nothing super specific there, man. Sorry. All right, let's see. John, we'll go back to the YouTube stream. John Buentello, I'm five foot eight, 173 pounds. You just started the bridge. Your tempo squat was difficult, but your working set was 225. Does this sound appropriate for your size? Well, it's not going to be size based. It's going to be squat based. So if you're squatting over 500 for reps, that's probably low for your tempo squat. But if you're squatting in the 300s for reps, then that's probably appropriate. Tyler Austin, uh, Jordan, my fiber intake is pretty low. What are good sources of fiber? Well, that's a Google search away, but hey, since you're here, we can do vegetables, some fruits, uh, whole grains, so oatmeal, breads, brown rice, sweet potatoes, regular potatoes, uh, beans. That's where you can start. Shots fired at Mark Bell. Oh yeah. I mean, I, anyway, let's not get let's let's move on. Let's move forward. Samson LaBeouf, not to be confused with Shia LaBeouf. Uh, I'm in the advanced novice phase with starting strength, switching to 3x3 three three on bench. Could the recovery gain from less volume make going back to larger increments optimal for training? No, and I wouldn't switch to 3x3 three three on bench. So effectively, you're lowering the volume. At that point, you are no longer training the bench. You are realizing previously trained attributes so what i mean by that is previously you're doing three sets of five which was more volume and now when you taper the volume down you're effectively peaking a little bit so i wouldn't actually switch to three by three on bench i don't think that's indicated all right ryan russo is it a waste to have a whey post-workout shake at the same time having a post-workout meal with 25 grams of protein um, not necessarily, uh, because 25 grams of protein may not be like three grams of leucine and might not have all the essential amino acids. It just depends where that protein's coming from. I mean, if you're having a post-workout meal with like 40 grams of protein, you don't need to shake with that. Um, but 25 grams, I just don't know for sure. Let's see. All right. Last one from the YouTubes and then we'll, we'll go back to the regular questions. We're about halfway through today, tonight's live Barbell Medicine podcast. All right, when using RPE for sets across, the RPE goes up by the time you get to set number four. Do I adjust for this? Um, not usually, because that's more of a central fatigue. That's more of a, you know, the bar speed usually moves pretty quick, pretty much the same anyway. It's just a more of a volitional RPE. So sets at like RPE eight, for instance, usually are done across unless you misrated them. If you misrated them, you called that an eight, but it was really eight and a half. And then the next set you do is a nine. You may consider removing a little bit of load to keep it closer to an eight. But if it's a true eight, usually you can repeat that for sets across. All right, let's go back to uh, the Instagram and Facebook questions. David Redding asks, is tendon calcification as scary as it sounds? You have a, he has a shoulder impingement in the shoulder with minor tender calcification. Minor tender tendon calcification is a thing that occurs with age. Um, you know, yes, calcification of the tendons can happen due to other pathologies that are somewhat scary, but not minor tendon calcification. That is a normal aging and use thing. All right. George Medinian, when someone that's switching from CrossFit after five years over to bodybuilding, uh, 
um, that had never had pure bodybuilding experience before, what's a realistic muscle gain they might be able to add for a male athlete? Um, I don't know if George is looking for like specific amounts and this is also context dependent. So if this is an older person, if this is a person who weighs more, not less, and if this is a person who, um, you know, yeah, like he said, has been training for five years uh, in CrossFit, the amount of muscle mass is going to be less than someone who's untrained, light and younger. Um, and like, for instance, if George was a vegan, he'd have less muscle mass gain than, than this person who would be not a vegan. So, uh, as far as how much I have no number for you, um, as long as the volume is appropriate and the overall fatigue and, and training frequency is correct, you'll gain muscle and the overall amount's probably going to have a lot to do with your genetics and hormonal status anyway. So the real question is why switch over to bodybuilding? You know, there are other ways to train to be productive, that uh, I would argue are more uh, beneficial for the time spent. All right, more questions here. Let's do two more here. We'll pop back over to the gram or to the YouTube. All right, regular John asks, through my training, I've been deadlifting and weightlifting shoes, but when prepping for a meet, do you suggest switching to flats? So I think it depends. If your goal is to go to the meet and just put up some numbers, basically test your one rep max and, uh, with the judges and your peers and get good videos and have a great time, I just get, keep your, leave your shoes on. If it's your first meet especially, just leave your shoes on. It's not a big deal. Uh, on the other hand, if you're going to a meet and you're actually going to go compete, you're going to get a podium position at a hotly contested meet, this is not your first meet, um, you, for instance, you're worried about your weight and, you know, you've got a handler. It's just a more serious, more serious thing. Then you, I would consider the last four weeks of your training pulling in flats. Um, you can also do that if you're just going to a meet for a recreation, you know, who am I to tell you, you know, what's serious and what's not serious. But I think that if you're a novice, introducing new variables to your training is probably not a good idea. If you are not a novice, then uh, you can take your shoes off about four weeks before the meet, go to the uh, go to the meet and and crush. Uh, that being said, it's funny. 2013, the 105 kilogram male national champion pulled his deadlift in weightlifting shoes, and he won. So you know, a lot of people can pull heavy in weightlifting shoes too. Uh, although that would be the exception to the rule. So I, I won't, I won't let my cognitive biases ruin this thing. Uh, Andrew Terrence, uh, if someone gains too much weight on their LP, what intermediate program do I recommend to facilitate a healthy cut as soon as LP is over? Uh, if you want specifics, the hypothetical lifter can be six to 300 pounds at 30% body fat. So that's far too much weight gained during an LP. That person while on LP, which again is like three to four months gained too much weight, probably should not have been gaining weight in the first place. So that's just a mismanaged LP. Uh, that being said, they could do the bridge and do the conditioning and be in a caloric deficit and still gain strength and lose body fat. All right, let's go back to the YouTubes. Thanks, guys, for tuning in, by the way. If you submit your questions, I'll really try to get to them. Uh, hey, Jordan, you rock, man. Hey, thanks. What about putting more upper body work into traditional starting strength LP? Currently benching three times a week, five by five, and don't want to drop it. So I think that if you're a novice and therefore are adding weight to the bar every single time you see an exercise, that by definition, you don't need that amount of frequency or volume to drive the adaptation. In fact, uh, it may preclude you from, um, from long-term development. So I would not add in extra stuff on your novice progression. That's, you know, less than 2% of all people who do the starting strength novice progression actually do it correctly, even if we give them a 20% error margin. So don't be one of those people. Look, it's only for a couple months. You can do all the volume in the world later. All right. Duran Boyd, I've been running 16, 8, intermittent fasting for seven weeks. So fasting for 16 hours, eating for eight hours with a five-day strength program with the intention of overall health improvement, lowering your LDL cholesterol. Your LDL has almost doubled. Thoughts? Well, intermittent fasting doesn't in and of itself lower the LDL, so that's not surprising. Five-day-a-week strength program sounds a little light on the actual strength training and a little dubious from the overall quality of the programming. Um, I don't know anything about you as far as height, weight, age, anything like that, a family history of like um, hyperlipidemia or cholesterol issues. So those are all things I'd want to know before like really figuring out why. But intermittent fasting, I wouldn't expect that to make a change. It sounds like you're eating, your diet has not been changed appropriately to lower your LDL and you're just realizing that after 
uh, you know, no effect from your training either. So you may need to do some conditioning. You may need to adjust your dietary intake. Uh, let's see. Uh, Fisher 453. I'm allergic to dairy, beef, corn, wheat, peanuts, soybean, and whole egg. Currently taking a pea and artichoke protein supplement that has two, thousand milligrams leucine per 21 grams of protein well, that sounds okay if you need a protein supplement if you don't don't do it patch lewis i understand you don't believe stretching foam rolling etc is necessary why because it doesn't do anything except for make you feel better subjectively but those same feelings can be had by just warming up the actual movement that you're about to do which is more specific to the movement you're about to do it allows you to practice all right, doesn't decrease your force production like foam rolling does. Foam rolling doesn't decrease injury rate, doesn't improve recovery rate. It doesn't do anything except for waste time compared to actually just doing a lift. Let's see. Nathan Miller, your Texas method on barbell medicine. How do you keep squats and deadlifts on novice linear progression but the press and... Huh? I don't necessarily understand that question. You just keep doing the starting strength novice linear progression for squats and deadlifts, and then you do the presses and benches on the intermediate schedule. So that's how I would do it. Michael Kara, what are your thoughts on Kratom and its efficacy? Is it really a miracle drug that Chris Bell claims it is? No. Consider the source. And uh, you've had major difficulty finding studies, articles from reputable sources. Yeah, so it's not as well studied as we'd like it to be to, you know, really drop the hammer on it. But it's been studied and it's not a wonder drug. Even like the opioid medications that we've had for years that we've used at really high doses are not wonder drugs for pain, recovery, uh, sleep modification, while in pain, stuff like that. So there is no miracle drug. It's certainly not Kratom. And it's also on the banned substance list. So there you go. Let's see. Within Darkness. Do I personally use the three-rep prescriptions for females as SSLP, starting strength, strength, linear progression, and advances? Do I do five triples instead of three sets of five? Sometimes. And it depends. So the more classically female someone is on the athlete spectrum, the more often I'll use that. So what that means is low vertical jump, a little bit wider hips, less upper body muscle mass, uh, less responsive to training in general. That basically means that they are not, they don't have, they have less masculine tendencies when it comes to training, all right? So they're kind of towards the female end on the uh, athletic phenotype scale. And I know these gender things can get me in trouble, so I'm just going to leave that there. But in any event, the closer, they are, the closer they are to the traditionally female side of that scale, I will use the five triples more uh, often than if they were more uh, masculine. So if you have a female that has a 22-inch vertical jump, for instance, doing five triples is not going to be useful for her because she's more like a guy as she responds to training. Just like there are some males who, you know, have more classically feminine traits as they respond to training. All right, back to the YouTube, or sorry, the Facebook and Instagram questions. Uh, Doug Wessel, quick question. Notice that's key for a block of text. Oh, no, this is fun. I have heard that overloading the weight on the bar to more than you can handle, specifically on bench, and doing a short range of motion can help get your ligaments and tendons used to higher weights before your muscles can actually lift them. Is there any truth to this? Some nuances in there, maybe. Oh, this thing is packed with nuance. So first, a few things. One, this assumes that your muscles rapidly increase in strength without progressively overloading the tendons and ligaments, which does not occur outside of using androgens or performance-enhancing drugs, okay? Your muscles don't just decide, hey, I've got the maximum voluntary contractile force to lift 500 pounds, but my tendons have only been previously exposed to 225. That's not how it occurs. You gradually, progressively overload the whole system. Um, so they basically co-develop together, all right? Um, and then think about using a super maximal load, right? So let's say you can bench 300 pounds. Think about, and you're using 500 pounds for a partial, uh, the top third. This is assuming that you can get the bar out of the rack, your shoulders are able to support it. Uh, once you initiate the descent, your elbows don't explode, your wrists don't explode, again, because none of these tissues have been exposed to anywhere near this amount of weight before. All right, and subsequently, that strengthens your tendons and ligaments more than just training a full range of motion at progressively heavier weights. So one, I don't buy that logic, and two, I think it's a good way to actually get hurt. Yeah, 
So, so that, that being said, said if you're doing a bunch of drugs, hey, that might work okay. okay. Let's see. C double. What are some of the heaviest lifts you can recall seeing at the end of a linear progression? I believe Fox uh, down at Wichita Falls squatted 495 or 515, I forget, for five sets for three sets of five. Bench 315 for three sets of five and pulled 545 or 565 for a set of five at the end of his LP. All right, Vincent Montes. In the test of strength template on uh, barbell medicine, this is one of the templates that I released, how much is the optimal rest between singles? So you can do five minutes. You can do, I mean, if it's out of meat, you'll likely get somewhere between eight to ten minutes between attempts. So you, I would just cap it at eight minutes if you're going to test by yourself. Yeah. Christopher Solars asks, I've got some nagging left quad soreness. If stretching and foam rolling are a waste of time, they are, and they do not decrease soreness outside of just being generally active. Is there anything useful you can do? Uh, you could squat. Or, I mean, basically, a soreness is just eccentric muscle damage and the inflammatory response going on. Uh, so should you do anything specific outside of continuing training? No, um, unless it's causing a bunch of pain and interfering with your training. Hot Rod Hero. Squats are killing my arms and shoulders. I've tried thumbs over, thumbs under, hands wide, hands narrow. Is there any info to alleviate this pain during squatting? Yeah, it sounds like you're jacking your elbows up during the descent of your squat. So I wrote an article about this called The Elbow Problem. And basically the humerus, humeri, should have the same angle as the back does during a squat. So on the way down, your elbow should be pinned into your side. On the way up, your elbow shouldn't flare away, you know, be jacked way up. Uh, they should stay pinned into your side. So that's usually the source of this elbow shoulder pain sort of thing. And if it's really, really tender, it's really, really affecting your training, you know, you get numbness, tingling, it's affecting your press and your bench, you might have to high bar for a few weeks to get it settled down. All right, last three questions from uh, the Facebook and Instagram, and then we'll move back to YouTube questions and wrap this guy up here in about 20 minutes. Uh, the Void says, I started training at the end of February this year. I started with the Strong Lifts program. After doing that for about five weeks, I bought and read Starting Strength, dropped Strong Lifts, began my LP. Okay. I was able to add weight to your lifts, uh, to my lifts every workout for about eight weeks, then decided to change to 531. Uh, I wasted four weeks on that program and moved to Texas Method after I became measurably weaker from 531. Shocker. Uh, after another three weeks or so, I was not able to move forward on the Texas Method and dropped it in favor of a modified 5x5 program that was kind of like Bill Starr's. Okay. Another few weeks on that, and I started messing around with my programming by myself. Uh, I am now in my eighth month, and although I made progress, I feel like it's been slow. My question is: Would it be worth to redo? Would it, would it be worth it to redo the starting strength linear progression, and then move on to something like the bridge? Let's see. Or do I need professional help at this stage? He's male, 42, 250 pounds, five foot ten, squats 385 for five, benches 255 for five, and deadlifts 405 for five. So just do the bridge right now, and after eight weeks, you're gonna have to hire a coach. And here's why. Training is obviously very, very important to you. You've tried to like go down this programming road by yourself, uh, but you're jumping programs all over the place because you don't believe in what you're doing and you don't have somebody else calling the shots. And that's probably the biggest reason to have a coach in addition to shortening the learning curve on how to program. So I think if you have the means, that's exactly what I would do. Do the bridge right now. It'll take advantage of any additional sort of rapid gains that you have because you're just going to load it based on RPE. And then after that, you're going to have to hire a coach. That would be my advice. All right, Seabright. 0147. Would you switch novice females to triples before adding a Wednesday light day or the other way around? And that depends. So this is kind of like that question earlier. Um, it depends on the female. If the female it exudes classically athletic traits, so again, narrow waist, broad shoulders, lots of muscle mass, high vertical, uh, high innate level of strength or really robust response to training, um, then I would probably do the, the light day prior to switching them to triples because I probably actually wouldn't switch them to triples, to be honest. All right, C Fessy 623 while training for competition deadlift, should one be training with a 27 millimeter deadlift bar or a 28 millimeter IPF approved bar with center knurling? Well, the IPF uses a 29 millimeter bar, uh, and so it depends on where you're competing. If you're going to compete in a federation that uses the clown bar, as I like to call it, or a deadlift bar, then you should lift on the deadlift bar, provided you're not a novice. If you're a novice, none of this applies to you because you're, it's not yet competitive powerlifting. Um, but after your novice progression um, and you're going to a meet, if they're using a deadlift bar at the meet, you should practice on a deadlift bar. If you're never going to go to a meet where they're using a deadlift bar, 
then don't buy one. There's no training benefits to it. Um, and I wouldn't do it. All right, back to the YouTube folks. Where's the science? Vegans have less muscle mass. Where's the science? I didn't say that. I said that they respond less robustly than their uh, meat-eating counterparts. And there's cross two cross-sectional studies, uh, large scale, that actually show that to be true. So anyway, it's okay if you're vegan. I'm not saying you're bad. It's just you're not you're not giving yourself any advantages to being big, strong, jacked. Let's see. You're, and okay, okay, again, where's the science? The speed of muscular growth. So effectively, if your meals are vegan and low in essential amino acids, you're getting a less robust response to eating. That's the science. Uh, let's see. Mm -mm -mm. If strength gains are possible in a deficit but not muscle gains, what is actually happening to allow strength gains if not gaining muscle? You are improving your technique, you are improving your ability to recruit motor units correctly, and you are improving the ability to sum motor unit recruitment to produce more force. Wilbur Salazar. Are diets high in carbs whilst overweight still recommended for an athlete? Uh, it could be if you're in a caloric deficit, you'll lose weight even when carbs are high. I know. Gary Taub somewhere, he just took his shirt off. Let's see. Ch -ch -ch -ch. Doctor needs a roadie. Got one. Uh, let's see. Have you read anything about the GZCL method for intermediate and advanced programming? No, I haven't. Ch -ch -ch -ch. What should the grip width be for the barbell row? Uh, about the same as a deadlift or bench press or somewhere in between. It's all the same. Ideal body fat at 15% body fat. It's ideal body weight at 16%, 15% body fat at six foot one. Uh, depends on the person, but you know, it'd be nice if you could be 220 at that body fat. John McCoy says you are doing pause presses. What are some of the benefits of the pause press and how does it improve your overhead? Basically it forces you to maintain this really hard position under isometric sort of positioning uh isometric sorry force production uh i don't know if my press has gone up yet but we'll see as you said with awesome rocky you should wait to eat every three hours to restart your protein synthesis uh yeah i did say that do you have any advice for increasing Luis gonzalez asks, do you have any advice for increasing grip strength for the deadlift yes hold the last rep of your last working set on the deadlift for 20 seconds each time you consume honey. Body of Knowledge says, I consume honey post-workout with protein powder. My thoughts on this carb source post-workout. I don't think that it's very good because it's got a high fructose component, which uh, doesn't go to the muscle. It's mostly metabolized in the liver. So I don't think it's very good. As you said with Austin Baraki, you should wait to eat every three hours to restart your protein synthesis process. Uh, should you not eat in between them? You should not eat in between them. You should make the meals bigger. Am I related to Harvey Weinstein? No, we're not all related, you know. So, uh, let's see. If you had to choose between coaching or nutrition from barbell medicine, what would you recommend? It depends on the person. If a person really needs nutritional help, well, there you go. But if their nutrition is mostly in check, we're really good at programming. Daniel Marks asks, when are you coming back to Australia? We're coming in January. So that's cool. Nariman asks, I'm 33, 6 foot 4, 230 pounds, and have almost a 38 inch hip at the top of the hip. Does my 40 inch, 40 inch waist still unhealthy? Yes. DJ Goodweiler. DJ, DJ Goodweiler. Is it possible to develop strength on a five day split? Uh, yes, but I don't know of any five day splits that I think are any good. Travis L., are you familiar with Alpha Destiny's novice program? I am not, but I'm going to go ahead and go on a limb and say that it's trash because it's Alpha Destiny. So there's that. I hate to sound so salty, but these guys really are bad. So NX Amaya, what about a percentage of body weight increase a month or weekly? No, I don't have any strict you know, rule of thumb recommendations there because it'd be all, it's all BS. You know, it depends on the person and the context. So I don't have that. I don't want to be quoted on it, you know? Let's see. Shrugging on squats. I would not recommend that, Will. 
upper back tightness. Uh, you know, one cue I got from Mac Ward was to just squeeze everything you can before you descend on the squat. Just whatever you can think about squeezing, squeeze it and don't let it go. Manuel Jimenez, how much does online coaching through barbell medicine cost on average? We don't really have an average cost, but if you guys want more information, we do we I mean, we do a lot of coaching. Uh, so it's info at barbellmedicine.com. Actually, it's a good time to mention. So we've got Alan Thrall coaching. Uh, we've got Austin Baraki coaching. I'm coaching. Leah Lutz is coaching. Uh, and we've got Vanessa Berman. She's a uh, registered dietitian and um, a 63 kilo powerlifter. So we'll see. Um, why do I dislike the Texas method? I wrote an article called Into the Great Wide Open. I would direct you there, my friend. It's on starting strength and barbellmedicine.com. Uh, Wilbur Salazar, should one begin starting strength if the goal is to compete in Olympic weightlifting? Well, I think if you want to compete in Olympic weightlifting, at some point you're going to have to get strong. And if you're untrained and you're a novice, there's no better program to complete prior to entering more specific training than starting strength. So there you go. Steven Armstrong, ideal body fat percentage for strength. There is not one. It's going to depend on the weight class. And also for health, there is not one. It's going to depend on the height and the person's genetics. Yeah, so I'm going to, get, I'm going to chalk that to a bad question, Stephen. Sorry, my friend. Kyle Fox asks, am I hitting PRs this weekend? This weekend, probably not. I did just hit a deadlift PR. Next weekend at the meet, I'm hoping to hit some PRs. Ryan Russo, thoughts on exercise science? You want to be a strength coach for athletes and you want to get your CSCS. Honestly, I think that's not a good career choice. And the reason why, it's not a rigorous science. So your scientific skill set is lacking when you get, and you'll have to do a graduate degree there. Um, you don't want to coach athletes because they don't have any money. And so that's hard to make a living that way. Uh, and a CSCS is not a good certification to have. It just is a gold standard to get you a job at any, you know, commercial gym or uh, other other facility in the United States. But you don't want to do that and have gone to school for it. It's too much money. The opportunity cost is not worth it. Dre C, any benefits to foam rolling as a warm up? No. So basically, the reason why you feel better after your foam roll is one, the placebo effect. Two, because it decreases the viscosity in the muscle. So by warming them up. Now you can do that through another any other general warm up. So I just pick squatting with a barbell. Von Meister, tore my distal bicep tendon mixed grip on the supinated hand. Does hook grip reduce the chance of re injury? Uh, I haven't seen like long term data on this, so I don't know. My intuition is that, yes, it does, considering that you had a injury uh, doing it this way before. So I would probably in the hook grip. If you're not going to compete, I would just use straps and do double overhand at heavy, heavy weights. Patch Lewis, should your pre-post workouts have the most amount of fiber because they consist 60% of your carb intake? Uh, no, not necessarily, unless you're on a cut and your calories are pretty low, and you need to keep your fiber intake up, and so you don't have any other choice. But fiber does delay gastric emptying, and you know, having a bunch of fiber uh, at one sitting uh, may make your, uh, your tummy upset. So in general, I like pre- and post-workout meals to have less fiber and less fat, um, provided that there's enough carbs uh, to go around to hit the other um, to hit the fiber uh, goals for the day. Is leg press an okay... Oh, wait. Where is this at? Ooh. We jumped. Is leg press an okay alternative to belted squats? To belt squats? Yes, but not squats with a belt. I like leg press, though. It's okay. How much protein in one meal? Six foot, 190 pound male. Depends how old you are, how vegan you are, and how well trained you are. But, you know, my general recommendation is anywhere between 30 grams to 40 grams of protein in a meal total, including trace proteins. As my squat increases, I find it harder to keep my eyes, head, eyes and head focused down, especially as you come out of the squat. You find yourself bringing your head and eyes up. How much power are you losing? I don't know. Um, it's hard to say, but certainly you have a tendency to lift your chest if you do it like that. Tips, use it, put a tennis ball between your chin and the chest and just use your warm-ups like that. Just keep your head in the same position. Uh, as soon as the Australia contracts are signed, I'll be spamming you guys on social media. So right now we just announced that we're going to be in Arizona 
in March of 2018 for the Barbell Medicine Seminar. So that's over on the barbellmedicine.com website if you guys are interested. Tom Goldsack. I'm two and a half months into LP and it's going great. I was wondering if it's possible to dedicate more time to getting stronger each week and still make consistent gains. Uh, I don't think I would train any more right now than you already are to get more gains. I would exhaust the uh what you're doing now before adding more training in ron asks hi jordan i'm 32 at 511 weighing 215 uh you bench press 345 pause squat 465 press 225 dead to the 545 very nice your question you're starting to plateau a bit and wondering if you should just gain a bunch of weight or stick it out and try to progress at this weight on heavy light medium well, it sounds like the training needs to be all your program needs to be altered yeah yep so i think you need to alter the programming um in order to drive your numbers up have you seen brian allsruth channel uh i have i don't really think anything of them yeah what do you think the largest programming mistake it, people make in strength training? Um, doing not enough volume. Yeah. Or too much volume at the wrong intensity. I mean, that's, you know, basically a catch-all, but there you go. Do I do blocks of hypertrophy training and rotate them with strength training? Sometimes. Not every time. So occasionally after a very long strength block, I'll do a block of GPP or hypertrophy work. Mainly it's like a restoration type block and resensitizing uh, to the, the main lifts. Train Sun. What modifications do you usually make to the deadlift on LP going from one set of five to what type of volume? So basically I'll do one set of five or one set of four and then have them take 10% off the bar and do two more sets of five or two more sets of four. Usually makes that go a little longer. Neanderthal. What is the purpose of just one day of pin bench on the bridge? Well, if you were going forward, I would run the pin bench a little longer. Gary Sellers. What about heavy dumbbell deadlifts? I don't like them. Because you can't load them heavy enough to, to be a regular deadlift, and you can't get in a good position to pull them from the floor because it's basically a deficit deadlift. So I don't really think that's useful. Is the squeeze cue the butt clench? I don't think I'm clenching my butt, but I might be. I might be. Let's see. Um, is the echo better? Maybe. Is the echo, maybe the echo's not, not any better. All right, we're going to answer two more questions, and then we're going to, we got to get out of here. Uh, how would you manage a strength training program to maintain the strength and do martial arts two to three times a week? Yeah, it's not going to work. Uh, I mean, I have a clients that do, are doing mixed martial arts training two to three times a week, but yeah, the it's hard to maintain because effectively you get beat up and really, uh, it's really hard to maintain uh, fatigue management that way, particularly folks who are, you know, over 30, 35. So that being said, he trains three days a week. He does two lifts per day, per day in and out in like 45 minutes and seems to be working all right. Uh, Iowa X, can a Smith machine be made to work if it is what you have? No, you cannot do barbell training on a Smith machine. And, you know, this just goes to show there are some times that you just can't train. Hey, I fixed the echo right at the end of this thing. <laughs> Well, well, I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. So look, hey, we got a couple hundred folks here. This is dope. Thank you for tuning in. It's going to be up on uh, YouTube. So yeah, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe to our channel. We put up regular content. Um, if, uh, we do a newsletter every uh, about every week. You can sign up for that on our website, barbellmedicine.com. That's where you got all our articles and podcasts and videos and stuff like that. And we just got another seminar that we're doing in Arizona. So if you guys want to go to that, check it out. Anyways, I'm Jordan Feigenbaum, MD. You can find me on Instagram, at Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine. And I do uh, Instagram Lives pretty regularly. My hetero life partner, Austin Baraki, is Austin underscore bar Barbell Medicine. He does Instagram Lives regularly as well. He couldn't be here tonight, but uh, next time. So thanks for tuning in. 
we'll catch you guys next time.